Okay, so we'll continue the second part of the systems and homeostasis lecture with a little bit of immunity. Uh, immunity is how we keep our body free from disease. Um, and there's a series of lines of defense, I think is probably not a bad way to think about it, that allows us to, to be free of pathogens or viruses or fungi, protozoans. Those are pretty common. Uh, most of you will probably end up taking the microbiology class, so you'll learn more about them there. So let's kind of look at the, the three basic lines of defense. The first one's on the bottom, first line of defense, and that's just barriers at the body surface. It's just things to prevent these usually microorganisms from entering the body. Um, your skin, your mucous membranes, there's enzymes, there's natural flora, you know, bacteria that prevent disease. It's got a number of different things that kind of help to uh, protect your body. Uh, tears, uh, urine flow, all of those things help, you know, the, you know, the body surface to, as a barrier. If something overcomes that, then we have these non-specific responses, oftentimes uh, phagocytes. Phago means uh, eating, site means cell. So these giant cell eaters that uh, take care of things that invaded the body. Uh, white blood cells, white blood cells that left the blood now become macrophages. Um, uh, various proteins, they fight off non-specific targets. Uh, so that's the kind of non-specific responses. And then the top part of the pyramid is your immune responses, sometimes called uh, learned specific immunity. And those are primarily uh, our chemical antibodies. Uh, they attack specific targets we often refer to as antigens. Uh, your white blood cells recognize these as foreign. Uh, you know, T cells and B cells are a little different, but they both help to uh, release chemicals that uh, specifically target different uh, invaders. So as an example, if you went and got a flu shot, that immunization would target your that specific invader and make antibodies against that. So that's the immune system. Nice, short, uh, easy one. The immune system often includes uh, three systems. Uh, the lymphatic, which we're going to just briefly discuss here. Uh, the integumentary, which serves kind of as that protection on the outside, that, that first layer of defense we just talked about. And then the cardiovascular, which has the white blood cells within it and other things that allow us to be more specific in terms of our immunity. So what does the lymphatic system do? Well, it does a couple of things. Um, one of its major function is to um, prevent edema. Edema is just the scientific name for swelling, right? In some places, they call that third spacing, uh, especially in nursing school. I'm not sure why. Um, I, I do know why. The first space is intracellular, um, so that's inside a cell. Uh, the second space is um, your plasma, that's the fluid that's in there. And the third space is the interstitial fluid. So if you have edema, it means you have an excessive amount of interstitial fluid. Um, and so the idea is to take that excessive fluid and return it back to the bloodstream. So that's one of the things lymphatics do. Uh, earlier in the last video, we talked about how lacteals absorb the fat-soluble things into your body. Right, and lacteals are part of the lymphatic system, so absorption of ingested fat is another role, and then immunity um, is the other big role of the lymphatic system. Uh, lymphatic tissue filters and cleans the lymph from debris, abnormal cells, and pathogens, um, so it's kind of like a giant filter. Um, the lymph system can also produce certain types of white blood cells, uh, not surprisingly, what we call lymphocytes, and that's a relatively similar cousin of those monocytes. So the lymph tissue can help us, you know, get free from disease as well. So those are kind of the major roles of the lymphatic system, and certainly immunity is one of them. Uh, lymphatic system makes up, uh, is made up of a number of different places. 
bone marrow is lymphatic tissue, lymph nodes, spleen, thymus, tonsils, uh, your appendix are all examples of lymph tissue. Now, kind of related, uh, as I mentioned, uh, the immune system is often considered lymphatic, cardiovascular, and integumentary. So let's look at some of the integumentary system um, functions. Uh, integumentary system is your skin and all the things associated with your skin, like your nails, your hair, your glands, and things like that. So a couple things that the um, integumentary system does. One, it helps to maintain body temperature. Uh, it maintains body temperature through a variety of different ways. Uh, first of all, um, our skin is like a blood reservoir. Most of our blood, two-thirds or so of it typically, is found on the venous side. And a lot of that venous blood just resides in the skin near the surface of our, uh, of our body. And it can help exchange heat uh, in that place. Um, if you want to retain heat, we can change the diameter of our arterioles, constrict them, so we don't have as much blood going to the skin and that most environments that will retain heat. When we get rid of heat, we can dilate those um, as well. And then since the integumentary system includes the glands within the skin, um, we can also worry about the amount of sweat we produce, right? So that's called evaporative cooling when sweat is released it evaporates off your skin or it takes a lot of heat to do that and removes heat from your body so the skin helps to maintain body temperature in a number of different ways by changing blood flow to the skin or um, uh, producing an amount of sweat or just keeping blood in the skin anyway uh, as a reservoir uh, your skin also offers a large protective mechanism it provides a physical barrier against abrasion uh, heat and chemicals, uh, you know, you will spill a little acid in lab on your hand. Um, you know, it's going to hurt, but it's not going to be as bad as if you spilled acid on an open cut, right? And if you don't believe me and you have a cut somewhere, you know, grab some, you know, lemon, cut it in half, squeeze it on your fingertip, probably doesn't hurt at all, squeeze it on the cut, then it's going to hurt a lot. So the skin helps to protect that. Um, it provides that physical barrier against entry of different microbes, so they just can't get into your body. And it also produces a bacteriostatic oily film that prevents bacteria from, uh, again, entering the body because it basically gets stuck there. Um, your skin helps to reduce dehydration. Uh, if you didn't believe this one, right, um, on next time at the store buy the biggest most expensive steak you can find uh, bring it home unwrap the plastic leave it on the counter overnight and then come back and look at it what's going to happen it's going to be all dried out um, the wrapping within the package helps to kind of keep the moisture in and that sort of acts like your skin does um, so uh, that becomes important in reducing dehydration as a matter of fact, people with severe, especially third degree burns over a large percentage of their body, one of the hardest things they uh, have in terms of uh, treatment is maintaining enough water in the body because it just, just evaporates off those areas because the skin has been damaged. Um, skin forms calluses. So in areas that is subject to repeated friction, uh, calluses will develop and protect the skin. Your skin allows sensation. We'll look at a lab in the skin later on the semester and kind of look at how sensation works in the skin a little bit. Um, your skin excretes stuff in small substances. In the sweat, it's not just water, but it's also uh, got a number of different things in it, including enzymes and ions and um, other things. And your skin also, in an exposure to sunlight, uh, makes vitamin D. Remember, we said vitamin D helps to control the calcium level. So those are all examples of integumentary functions. Um, you don't have to look at this. You don't have to um, worry about it. But, you know, I just put it in here for old, old time's sake, right? Uh, I would be surprised if you didn't have this model in your anatomy class because it seems like every... I've taught anatomy at, I don't know, seven, 
institutions, and they all have this model. So it's like the, the most common one. Let's talk a little about reproduction. I'm going to go a little different route with reproduction here. Uh, I'm going to focus less on the reproductive structures and, and how they work, and probably to most of your relief, a uh, fairly easy uh, idea, but I just kind of want to make this, this point uh, for male reproductive and female reproductive function and, and how they are so different in some ways. Um, so, you know, for male reproduction, right, the testes produce the sperm, okay? And testes, right, is plural, testis is singular, um, and it's each one is divided into about 300 lobes um, of what they basically uh, consist of semi seminiferous tubules, and that's where the sperm is formed. Uh, once sperm form, then they move to the epididymis for maturation and storage. Um, then when males are ready to release the sperm, right, it moves to the vas deferens into what are called ejaculatory ducts and then out the urethra. The average male makes somewhere around roughly 500 billion, billion with a B, sperm in one lifetime. Uh, Men can release somewhere between 40 million and even up to a billion, over a billion sperm at a time. All right. And what they release actually is, is in semen, and semen is formed by secretions from a number of different glands um, that help to aid the sperm and, and make it uh, more viable, basically. So, you know, sort of the, the take home lesson is lots and lots and lots of sperm. Okay. Um, females, on the other hand, are only born with 200 million uh, eggs. We call them scientifically oocytes. Um, and they are actually arrested in meiosis. They are still undergoing development, but they don't do anything else. And to be honest, a lot of those die off. Like, I don't know, 60, 70, 80% of them die off. And by the time women reach age seven, they have a 300,000. And by the time they start to ovulate, that's by definition when puberty occurs, um, they're only going to ovulate four or 500 eggs over their entire lifetime. And typically uh, a hormone called luteinizing hormone known as LH uh, helps to cause ovulation. Um, and that's when the egg is released from the ovary. The egg travels through what's called the oviduct, uh, the uterine tube, or sometimes known as the fallopian tubes, to the uterus. Uh, most of the time, if the egg gets fertilized, it happens somewhere in that pathway along the oviduct. If it's fertilized, it forms what's called a zygote, and that implants. Uh, if not, it'll just come out with the menstrual flow. Uh, a couple hundred sperm typically reach the upper regions of the oviduct. It's a relatively long way for their microscopic size. Uh, the vast majority of human fertilizations occurs within that oviduct. And what happens is only one sperm, and actually not even the sperm, but just the uh, head of the sperm with the uh, genetic material will enter uh, the cytoplasm of the oocyte. And once it does that, it fuses and then completes meiosis, basically. So, you know, men billions and billions of sperm women a couple hundred eggs over a lifetime so huge difference in terms of the number and their reproductive strategies uh, for that all right so uh, you know I'm good enough for reproduction uh, wouldn't worry too much about these uh, pictures and we skip the men obviously you know this would be a, a sperm uh, this right here is called a fertilization halo and this is what prevents um, multiple sperm from entering. And, you know, we're not going to get into it at all, but, I, you know, I think that most of you realize, um, and even from commercials now, right, 23 and me, um, we have two sets of 23 chromosomes, one we got from mom, one we got from dad. And so humans don't work very well unless we have that full complement, what's called the diploid number of chromosomes, which is 46. Uh, with 46 chromosomes, that's the ideal number. 
there are a few where you can have one too many and and you know like uh, down syndrome is when you have an extra chromosome number 21 uh, there are a number of um, disease states where uh, you have an extra sex chromosome. But for the most part, we don't tolerate that very well as a human species. And it usually results in, in death of the uh, fertilized egg. So we have to maintain the diploid number chromosome. So if we allowed two sperms to enter an egg, then we would have instead of 46 chromosomes, right, you'd have... 69 chromosome and that wouldn't work at all so that fertilization halo is kind of important uh, the only reason I bring it up is you don't have to know it for anything but just to know it's there for your own edification uh, we used to do an experiment that you could see this under a microscope um, and uh, we deal with sea urchins and so we get sea urchins and we get some to produce eggs and some to produce sperm and you would mix them on a depression slide and you could be able to see that and it's kind of neat to see although sometimes it took a long time and it's hard to find the other part of this uh, lecture is the idea of homeostasis and the most important part of physiology is probably homeostasis as I mentioned before and what homeostasis basically looks at is organisms maintain a stable internal working environment so that they can function op optimally and that's kind of the idea um, and so even though the external environment can fluctuate it can go really cold or really warm humans for the most part unless you're stranded somewhere in an extreme heat or cold can tolerate you know large changes in temperature fairly easily so Homeostasis is a maintenance of a stable or constant internal environment, right? It's a dynamic equilibrium where we maintain a set point. We'll kind of come back to those ideas in a second. Um, sometimes it's nice in physiology to look at the people who came before us and kind of set the pathways for us. Uh, in the one of the first videos for lecture, we, we talked about Aristotle and Hippocrates and uh, now we'll mention a French physiologist by the name of Claude Bernard. Um, he was the first person to kind of define the term homeostasis. He didn't define homeostasis per se, but basically he said that uh, the internal working and the conditions of the body have to maintain stable. Uh, he was a French physiologist, so he called it the uh, milieu interior. Uh, but the idea was the same. So he is often credited as the person coming up with the idea of homeostasis, and he provided some evidence. An American physiologist by the name of Walter Cannon uh, actually did a ton of homeostasis uh, uh, research. Uh, he actually came up with the uh, term homeostasis, which he meant uh, to be same within oneself. That's what it translates to. Um, he also, you might have heard of the fight or flight, so he coined the fight or flight response and studied that. And he also put forth uh, what are called the four postulates of homeostasis. We'll pick them up later in the semester, we won't worry about them now. But, you know, the point is he, a large portion of his research dealt with the idea of homeostasis. So there's a number of, of homeostatic mechanisms that help keep our body free from disease. Uh, first of all, uh, when we talk about the body, we're really talking in terms of the stable environment um, as your extracellular fluid. Now, it's a little bit different because it doesn't technically include the intracellular fluid, but your extracellular fluid to a large extent determines what happens to your intracellular fluid. So whether related, um, it's not considered to be um, the intracellular fluid. And the reason why is we can't directly affect it. We can directly affect our extracellular fluid by, you know, you want to increase it, drink water, gets absorbed in the stomach, you've increased your, uh, your stomach, your small intestine, really. Um, and uh, you've increased your body water, you know. So uh, we can't do that for a cell directly. Um, so homeostasis is really considered the external environment. Um, for not your cells, so the extracellular fluid. 
so in order to you know kind of look at this let's talk about some of the things that are homeostatically regulated okay uh, body temperature blood ph blood pressure blood glucose let's talk about some of them so body temperature what's the normal body temperature of a human well most of you probably immediately thought 98.6 and that's great and that's true and we're all different, so it's the average temperature is 98.6. If we took everybody who's watched this video in the last week's body temperature at the exact same time, not everybody's going to be 98.6. Since we're scientists, though, we want to look more at the Celsius level. So normal body temperature in that scale is 37 degrees. Blood pH. Uh, Blood pH is about 7.4. Blood pressure. It's actually talking about mean arterial pressure, and we'll talk about why. And But most of you probably realize we have to have a normal blood pressure. If it got too low, we wouldn't be able to pump blood, and we would pass out and maybe die. If it got too high, that's a disease state, and that can cause you know pathological conditions, so we can't have that. So we need to have it at a normal level. Right, like your systolic diastolic would be like 120 over 80, right? And we homeostatically regulate blood pressure um, and blood glucose. And in terms of uh, blood glucose, the magic number is like 70 to 100 milligrams per deciliter. So uh, all the values that we're looking at in terms of homeostasis is what we call the set point, right? And so the set point is the value that you fluctuate around. And sometimes it's easier just to give an example than a definition. And the set point for body temperature would be what? 37 degrees Celsius, right? The blood pH set point is probably 7.4. That's the value that you maintain. So in order to maintain homeostasis there's a couple things we kind of have to look at all right uh, first of all uh, the parameters have to be maintained within fairly uh, level normal narrow however you want to say it limits all right so as an example your body temperature is 37 degrees if it's 36.9 is that still okay yeah if it's 30 2.1 is that okay probably not so <clears throat> you have this very relatively narrow range that the parameter has to be maintained in um, there exists what they call a dynamic steady state some people use equilibrium state a steady state is probably better so that means that <clears throat> the parameters fluctuate within a narrow range and they fluctuate around what's called a set point okay so uh, the dynamic equilibrium basically says, and I, I like steady state better for this reason. If it's if you, if it's an equilibrium, you may not realize that you have to continuously put energy into this to keep the set point where it is. Um, so, as an example, if you're in the cold environment and you want to maintain your normal body temperature at 37 degrees Celsius, you have to input a lot of energy in that dynamic steady state. In order to keep body temperature at a normal level so that's important um, and then homeostasis needs to detect and be able to control variables right so you have to be able to see hey is is this normal and if it's not you have to be able to respond to it and bring that value back to the set point okay so I'll, just to kind of look at it here our set point is our target value so again, let's say it's body temperature, and let's go with 37 degrees Celsius. The dynamic equilibrium tells us our body temperature under normal conditions will fluctuate around 37 degrees. Uh, it might be 36.8, it might be 37.2, but it's going to keep it within a narrow range. And the way it does that is with uh, antagonistic control. Antagonistic control is a bi-directional system that work oppositely. And the way we control things in homeostasis is by what we call negative feedback. So when the variable 
goes away from the set point, we have the ability to bring it back and maintain that set point uh, for various uh, reasons. So here's an example on this graph right here. So this is a person's blood glucose levels. Okay? And this is, you know, not a great drawn graph, but, you know, this is 60, that's 80, that's 100. So they're, you know, between these two white lines is a 20 uh, milligram per deciliter increment. So this is probably like, what, 92? So at 92, right, at midnight, your blood was 92 for glucose. And then at 6 a.m., it dropped down to 88, let's say. And then all of a sudden you ate breakfast. And when you eat breakfast, you take some of that food you ingested, right, break it down into glucose, its basic unit, absorb it, and then your blood glucose goes up. Now, it doesn't continue to go up forever. You release a hormone that uh, takes the blood, the sugar out of the blood, and puts it into cells. And that lowers blood sugar back to normal. And that's called negative feedback. Uh, sorry on that. Um, I the high turned it off. I actually changed the slide when I coughed. Um, so negative feedback is an important way we control things, and negative feedback needs to have antagonistic control. We need to be able to bring the variable back uh, to the normal level. We do that through a couple different ways. This should say intrinsic, right? So this. I don't know, so it should be like extrinsic, right? It should be intrinsic. Intrinsic ways through autoregulation. So our body helps to control that. Um, intrinsic means it comes from the organ or system itself. We can also do it through extrinsic control mechanisms. And those are nervous and uh, that's the neural or what they call humoral. Humoral is a scientific way to say carried in the blood. So there would be like uh, endocrine hormones. Um, and so... Uh, in order to maintain body temperature, as an example, we use negative feedback. So if body temperature goes up, our core body temperature is too high, it's above 37 degrees, so our body releases sweat, right? And that sweat causes the blood uh, body temperature to drop, and that's back to normal. And if body temperature went down, right, we would change blood flow, and that would retain more core heat and body temperature go back up. So uh, going back to set point in both directions, that antagonist control is absolutely essential uh, for how this, this works. So let's look at homeostasis as an example using glucose. So here's our homeostasis blood glucose level. Let's call it um, 80. Okay. Uh, based on this one, let's call it 100. That would make it right in the middle. And I'll show you these numbers at the top left and right. Oh, sorry, top and bottom left. And so we'll call this 100. So let's say your, your blood glucose is homeostatically uh, maintained at 100. So that would be, by definition, our set point. Okay. Um, we saw when we looked at uh, calcium in the previous video and how it's controlled by calcitonin and uh, parathyroid hormone right? It was antagonistic. Well, glucose is also antagonistic. So if your blood glucose goes up, let's say you've eaten, right? Then you become what's called hyperglycemic. So this is saying once your blood glucose gets above 120, okay? 120 milligrams per deciliter, also known as milligrams per cent, your beta cells sense that your blood sugar is too high, and they release a hormone called insulin. And insulin affects a couple different places primarily. It can affect a number of places, but the two big places we're worried about is your cells uh, take up more glucose, especially your muscle cells. And also it causes the liver cells to take up glucose and eventually store it as glycogen. So if your blood sugar goes excessively high, we have a mechanism where we can release insulin, a hormone. It's going to cause blood sugar to be shoved into various places that aren't the blood and thereby lower the sugar in your blood back to normal. Now, let's say that, uh, you know, you've been sitting, you know, looking at videos all day 
you haven't eaten, and now your blood sugar is going down. Well, because of the antagonistic control, negative feedback, both directions, with insulin, right? If it went too high, we release insulin, it goes down. If it goes too low, we have a different hormone. This actually comes from the alpha cells of the pancreas. And we release a hormone called glucagon. So you can see it here on the bottom right. What glucagon does is glucagon goes to the liver and also skeletal muscle. And sorry, the liver only, not skeletal muscle, the liver only. Um, and we'll talk about why a little later when we get to receptors. Uh, and what it does is it causes the liver to break down that glycogen, that polysaccharide we stored, break it into single sugar units of glucose, and then put it into the blood. And as we start to dump that glucose into the blood, the blood sugar goes back up and goes back to a normal level. So no matter which direction we go, that's called negative feedback. Okay. Now, one other kind of idea, um, and this is from a previous book we used, but I like the idea so much I kept it. Um, I might add a couple things to it, but uh, what uh, we have here is what's called the four basic themes of physiology. And in terms of the uh, four basic themes of physiology, uh, we can outline each one. We'll kind of go through them. So. I will go to the first one. The first one's called structure function relationships. And for the base, four basic themes of physiology, looking at structure function relationships, uh, there are actually three subparts of this. This is the most difficult one. That's kind of where I made it number one, although probably number four is probably the most important, but they're all really important. Otherwise, they wouldn't be these basic themes. So of the structure function relationships, there's a couple that uh, we worry about. The first is called molecular interaction. And molecular interaction is, is how it sounds. It's the ability of molecules to react or interact with each other. So a, uh, a protein binds to a receptor to have some sort of action because it has the right three-dimensional shape. So structure function relationships are important, and one of those is called uh, molecular interactions. The other, well, there's three of them. So the next structure function relationship um, is uh, referred to as mechanical properties. And mechanical properties uh, define the system and what it can do, right? And structure, to a large extent, tells us about function. So as an example, while ligaments and tendons are somewhat similar, and they're both in a very uh, uh, similar type of connective tissue, but tendons stretch a great deal, while ligaments in some cases don't stretch at all. So their mechanical properties help to determine function. And the last one is called compartmentation. I don't think any of us probably would have come up with that word. We would have called it compartmentalization, but it's basically the same idea. And it says that we separate different things into compartments so that we can specialize function. And a great example of compartmentation are the organelles within a cell, right? Um, so, you know, mitochondria make energy and, uh, you know, the... Uh, Golgi, right, or in this case is not the Golgi, this is the um, rough ER, uh, makes uh, proteins, here's a smooth ER, right, that makes uh, lipids and things. So, uh, you know, each one of these organelles has a specialized function, and that's uh, called compartmentation. Another important one, we've talked about this um, almost every lecture, maybe every lecture so far. And that's biological energy, right? Um, we need to make energy to fuel all these things happening in our body. And so uh, we need a continuous input of energy uh, to use for the synthesis and breakdown of molecules, the transport of molecules, especially against a gradient or movement. Uh, actually, you know, energy to move is not really 
uh, our biggest concern. It's actually energy to move things against a gradient is uh, takes more energy than just moving throughout the day. Uh, theme three is on communication. Cell-to-cell uh, -cell communication is vital, and so this is showing all types of examples of communication with our glycoproteins uh, and glycolipids. Uh, communication by just cells moving, sorry, cells, uh, molecules moving from one side of the membrane to the other, or communication with specifically shaped uh, things. This is on a ribosome and making basically, you know, reading DNA to make a protein. So that communication uh, allows information to flow across a cell membrane or uh, between cellular components. Um, cell mem mem membranes, as you all know, are selectively permeable, and so sometimes that communication has to take different forms. And our last theme is on homeostasis. Uh, body systems work together to form homeostasis, and here's a great example of homeostasis and the different types of negative feedback. I'm not going to talk any more about it because we just did previously for a while. So that concludes the lecture from this section and uh, we'll see you later.